hey hey odyssey scholars what's happening um we've talked about the odyssey this big epic poem and about how it relates to a hero so when i start teaching about the odyssey i always think about my heroes and so that's why i've got my my peyton manning broncos jersey on he's one of my heroes he's a good dude he was a big strong athlete um you know, he went to the University of Tennessee and played quarterback there. Heisman Trophy winner, if you guys know what the Heisman Trophy is, best college player in the country that year. Then went on to have an unbelievable NFL career as a quarterback, arguably the best quarterback of all time. And he, he's been one of my heroes because he, like I said, big, strong, athletic guy, and I like sports. Uh, he's really, really smart and intelligent. He's a good person. Like he goes out of his way when you read stories about him to to do things for people that um, kind of behind the scenes that have helped him out along his way and his, his journey through success. And um, just like many of the the heroes that we learn about or that we talked about, like he goes through kind of a, a long, you know, epic odyssey or journey along the way to uh, or throughout his life and he battles injuries and certain things in his career to get to where he's at today he's now retired but again considered one of the maybe the best quarterback of all time uh, to ever play football but he's kind of been one of my heroes so that's why i wore my my peyton manning jersey so fire up let's talk more about um, some heroes here in odyssey in that epic poem um, called the the Odyssey. The first, okay, well, let me back up. If we were going to read the whole thing, like, we'd be here forever. It would take us forever. It's huge. So, we are going to kind of chop out what we call the first eight books of the Odyssey. We're not really going to read those things word for word like we're going to read some of the other books of the Odyssey. But we don't want to leave those out for you. So, we're going to make sure that we do an overall overview of those first eight books here with the Odyssey. And so um, not that you want to listen to us English teachers talk the whole time. We're going to watch um, some short summaries and analysis of those first eight books. And we're going to take some notes on those, but I'm going to walk you through those notes. Okay. So as we watch these um, clips, pay attention to them. We'll go back and talk about each clip that we just watched and about the book or books that it covered as we go through, again, books about one through eight, because about book eight and nine is where we will start to actually read it and maybe listen to it and watch it or act it out or whatever in class. Now, I get it. Acting it out right now is a little bit different as we're, we're virtual, so we might not be going that route for a little while, but that's okay. So get a pen and pencil out. Actually, don't because you're going to be typing out the notes. Um, the, what do you go, Mr. C? And pay close attention. And we're going to learn a little bit about the beginning part of the Odyssey. Buckle up. Here we go. Book one of the Odyssey begins at the top of Mount Olympus, where Zeus, the god of gods, consults with his favorite child, Athena, about whether or not she and Hermes should get involved in Odysseus's life, meaning he's stranded, his family's in Ithaca, and terrible things have befallen them, and they're deciding whether or not they should intercede or get involved and help them out. And it establishes a really important theme, that the gods are watching out for us. After a long discussion, it's finally decided that Athena and Hermes will get involved in helping Odysseus come home and counseling his family. What's going on in Ithaca? Not so pretty. Basically, Penelope, Odysseus's estranged wife, refuses to give up hope that her husband isn't going to come home. Meanwhile, these suitors, about 108 of them, including their servants and the family's turncoat servants, have taken up residence in their palace, drinking all the wine, eating all the food, and generally causing mayhem. They say, hey, Penelope's royalty, she's available, and we're gonna wait around until she picks one of us. That's hospitality, and that's the custom. Now, Telemachus, who hasn't seen his father since he was a baby, is 20 years old now. Odysseus left home 20 years ago 
to fight in the Trojan War. And 10 years ago, he began his journey home. Now in disguise, Athena comes down and meets with Telemachus. But with. But oversees him conferencing with the suitors, telling them it's time for them to go. It's finally time for him to step up and take a stand, to move forward, get these suitors out of the house, find his father and bring him home, and reunite his parents and their kingdom. Meanwhile, Penelope, holed up in her room, is working on a death shroud for Odysseus's aging father, Laertes. She holds on to that little bit of hope, another important theme in the book, for homecoming to happen, for justice to be restored, and for things to become the way they were. She works on this shroud, but undoes her work every single night. Why? Because the custom is, when that shroud is finished, she needs to pick one of the suitors, and the suitors are holding out hope that that's going to happen. The book establishes some really important themes, not just about fate and the gods and about fathers and sons, but about hospitality, that these suitors are allowed to just come in, pal around, and generally live at the palace doing whatever they want because they are guests. And it also establishes another theme, justice. We see that so much has gone wrong and that Odysseus is gonna need to come home to set it right. Okay, so if you can open up that notes sheet that you have. Let's talk about what just was talked about for what actually happens during um, book one. So it starts out with Zeus. Make sure you don't mix up the spelling there. A lot of people spell it Z-U-E-S. Zeus, who is... Is, is he's like the king of the gods, the god of the gods. He connects with or discusses with some of his children. His children. Whether to help out Odysseus on his return home to Ithaca. Now remember, he's been gone for 20 years because he went to fight in the Trojan War. Um, his, his son had just been born. We're talking about Odysseus, his son, Telemachus, had just been born. Um, he left kind of reluctantly. Um, he, his son, Telemachus, his wife, uh, Penelope. So that's where they're, they're at. Uh, Zeus decides that um that they should help out odysseus and his daughter athena and son hermes will help as we read further along as, as we'll find out some of the other children and, and other gods don't want, want to help out and they make the oh the odyssey home the journey home for odysseus rather rather difficult Okay, the next thing we learn about in Ithaca. So all these these guys know that this war has been over, yet Odysseus hasn't returned yet. And so they're saying he's dead. Odysseus is dead. Um, and these guys that we call suitors. And so in Ithaca, um, suitors. Over, I'm going to put overrun the palace. Palace of Odysseus. As they like to have Penelope for their wife. They see that if they marry Penelope, they're kind of the king. She's the queen of, of Ithaca. Um, they would get this huge palace, these probably fortune that they've amassed. And so they want her hand in marriage. Do they really want her? No, they, they want to be king. In order to become king, they've got to have her hand in marriage. Um, and I think it mentioned there were 108 of them uh, suitors. Plus all their servants or close friends. So the palace has kind of turned into this big like mess where these guys are there eating all the food, drinking all the wine, kind of just lounging 
um, scrubbing around the palace and they don't do any work. They don't clean up. Like it's become kind of a, like I said, kind of a mess. Uh, so Telemachus, Telemachus decides the urging of the gods to try to find his father. Just so you remember. So that's kind of what's going back on back in Ithaca. Penelope holds out hope. Penelope holds out hope that Odysseus is still alive and stays faithful to him. She's got all these dudes that want to marry her. Her husband's been gone for 20 years. I mean, she could have very easily married one of them, um, but she believes her husband's alive and, and stays faithful to him, which becomes one of the, the themes of the story. Um, it, it also talked about a couple of themes here. So let's themes. One, it mentioned dads are watching for us. Two, second theme, hospital. This is a, or something we want to understand about ancient Greek life as well. Like that's the custom to be hospitable to guests. Um, nowadays it'd be different if, if some bunch of strangers showed up at your door, you wouldn't just invite them in, feed them, um, allow them to wash up and give them a place to stay and then ask about who they were. You do the opposite, right? You'd be kind of reluctant, like, Ooh, stranger, I'm not letting them into my house until you really got to know them. Back ancient Greek times, if, if strangers came to your house, um, that was, that's, that's what you did. That that's what culture expected you to do. Uh, you, you invite them in, you, you feed them, uh, you house them, you give them a place to stay. Um, you don't ask questions until after that fact. So Penelope, she was just kind of following Greek culture and tradition by when these suitors showed up, she had kind of her, her hands were tied. Um, that's what she had to let them in. She had to let them live there and eat all the food and drink all the wine and kind of make themselves at home. So hospitality, I'm just going to put ancient Greek way of life. Um, Penelope allowed suitors to live in palace. And then it mentioned a third Uh, Ithaca had run um, mock things had nope, I don't even know how to spell it. Let's, let's use a different word. Uh, Ithaca had gone bad. The need to make things right as we'll see in the story and Odysseus's journey home. Okay, so that's kind of what we learn in, in book one. Ready for book two? I hope you are, because that's what we're doing. Here we go. In book two of the Odyssey, Odysseus' son stands up to the suitors, gathers them all together, and he says, enough is enough. You mooches need to go. But the suitors fire back. Hey, your mom Penelope promised she'd marry one of us, and we're not leaving until she does. Meanwhile, Penelope has been in her room working on a death shroud for Odysseus' aging father, Laertes. This is a custom that she is rising up to meet knitting this thing slowly 
but as she gets close to the end, she undoes her work, continuing the process, and she's been working on it now for four years. The symbol of the death shroud is important because it represents that little bit of hope, that little kernel of faith in physical form or manifestation that Penelope has that her husband is still out there and that there's a chance he can come home. By undoing her work instead of completing it, she keeps that faith alive. This shroud stands as Penelope's excuse to keep her belief stoked, to keep the fires burning, and to keep the suitors at bay as long as she possibly can. In this way, Penelope moves the action forward of the suitors waiting. It keeps the belief in hospitality or the theme of the suitors sticking around alive and it sets up all the action that can happen while she's waiting at home and Odysseus is working to return. Now Zeus sends down two eagles and they also keep up that kernel of faith that Odysseus is coming home. And when he does, it's going to mean swift, brutal justice for those suitors. Meanwhile, Athena counsels with Telemachus and disguises herself as him, summoning men and ships so that Telemachus can potentially go out and inquire and learn about the whereabouts of his father. This is another important theme. All that interceding, all that getting involved from the gods. Athena literally dresses up as Telemachus. She sets up his journey for him. But, like we'll see a lot in the book, there are motifs like wind and disguises that mean the gods are working on your behalf but the mortals are going to have to meet them halfway. The gods may create that path, but the mortals are going to have to rise up and walk it. Okay, book two, done and complete. Man, that's that's fast, isn't it? Where are you, where are you through books one and two? Holy smokes. All right, so what happens in, in book two? Um, again, a brief summary, Telemachus, Old. I guess. What does he do? Stands up to the suitors. He's he's 20 years old now. He's a young man, and he wants these guys out of his palace, um, or out of his wife's, pa or excuse me, his mom's palace. He, like you said, he he's kind of seeing maybe, maybe I I should be the powerful one here. Maybe I should be the next king um, of Ithaca. So he stands up to the suitors. They tell him that his mother, Elope, had promised to choose one of them to be her husband. And they would not leave until she had done so. Which she had done. Um, but she comes up with a plan because she still has that hope, that faithfulness, that Odysseus is still out there and alive. So what's her plan? Well, her plan is to, she's making a shroud, I believe they call it, for Odysseus's father, Laertes, and every night she undoes her work. But she said that as soon as she's done making that shroud, um, she will then choose one of the suitors to marry. Um, so this is kind of her trick, and they said it took her, at this point she's up to, like it's taken her like four years uh, to make that shroud. So she's she's holding out hope. And he mentions, the guy that we just listened to, you know, those literary terms that we talked about earlier this year. Well, here's another one. He said the symbol, the shroud is a symbol of hope because that is still what she's doing to hold on to hope. Um that Odysseus is out there and will be making his way back home at some point. Again, we go back to one of the themes that the gods and goddesses help out or are watching out for humans in, in life and in these stories. Uh, it mentions that Athena, 
without Telemachus in his search for his father. We, that's about all you need to know. Um, we talked a little bit more specifically about that in there, but again, we see a goddess here, a, a Athena, intervening in the life of a human, a mortal, um, to try to obviously help them out. All right, so book two. Done. Books three and four here are next, and he talks about those together. I'm just kidding. I like that song. In book three, Telemachus and Athena, disguised as mentor, arrive in Pylos, and they witness a sacrifice of bulls being made to Poseidon. Athena tells Telemachus to seek out and keep an eye on Nestor, and also to be bold in asking questions about his father's whereabouts. This is where Telemachus really learns the importance of appeasing the gods. Now, Nestor doesn't have a lot of information for them, but he does tell the story of Agamemnon, who fought alongside Odysseus in the Trojan War, and he contrasts Penelope's fidelity and devotion with Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra's infidelity. Nestor shows hospitality to Telemachus and offers him help in the form of his son, Pisistratus. Nestor also advises Telemachus to go to Sparta and meet with Agamemnon's brother, Manelaus. Athena transforms herself into an eagle. Now, Nestor recognizes this and also Athena having been mentor. And this brings up an important plot point in the book that we see the importance of mortals recognizing the gods' actions and paying respect to them as duty. In book four, Telemachus ventures to Sparta, where he meets with Manelaus and Queen Helen. And there, Manelaus recounts how he knows Odysseus is alive in the first place. Manelaus had been stranded on the island of Pharos, unable to leave because he had offered an insufficient sacrifice to the gods. There, he had wrestled the shape-shifting Proteus to the ground, finally pinning him and forcing Proteus to admit that he knew what happened to Agamemnon and to Odysseus. Telemachus is deeply moved by Manelaus's and Helen's love for his father. He ends up telling them about what's going on with the suitors, and that is when Manelaus tells him that he knows that his father is alive on Ogygia, stranded by Calypso. Meanwhile, back in Ithaca, the suitors and Penelope learn of Telemachus' departure. The suitors plan to assassinate him when he returns, but Penelope learns about this plot. Athena sends the phantom of Penelope's sister to tell her that Athena is watching out for her, but the phantom reveals nothing about Odysseus' whereabouts. Book four has some major important themes happening. The role of hospitality showing virtue in the characters, how important deception is, and the limited role of interference from the gods in the mortal lives. All right, we're cruising. Books three and four, what do they tell us? Well, Athena, again, she's, she's a goddess, right? So she's immortal. Works with Telemachus to journey out to find out information about Odysseus. Telemachus is led to King Nestor. Nestor invites him in, and again, I'm going to put there in parentheses, hospitality, because that becomes a key theme for this story. And what does Nestor tell him? Invites him in and tells him to go to Sparta. Sparta. 
And who does he find in Sparta? King Menelaus. You know what, folks? I'm not going to lie to you. Let me open and honest with you. King Menelaus. I don't want to have you guys spell words wrong. Hey, every once in a while, as teachers, we don't know everything. Got to remind myself how to spell some of these crazy names. Menelaus. Oops. King Menelaus and Queen. And this was his wife. Helen. Speak to Lemachus. Show him hospitality. 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 And tell them that they know Odysseus is alive. In fact, King Menelaus tells a story, as it mentioned here, about him kind of fighting some guy. Uh, to get the truth out about what has happened to Odysseus. And this then gives um, give hope and reassurance to Lemachus that his father is alive. Uh, this is crucial because this basically, I, I think Telemachus has gone on this journey with the hope that his father's alive, but this is kind of like the, the reassurance, like, yeah, someone that was actually like with my dad is telling me, like he's got firsthand knowledge that my dad is alive. Um, and they do let him know. Um, held up. on the island of Calypso, who we'll meet later on. Um, back at home. So in if in Ithaca, it mentioned Penelope and the suitors become aware of Telemachus's journey. And suitors plot to assassinate him on his return. Uh, Penelope finds out about these plans and starts to um, <laughs> make some plans of her own not to let that happen. So that's where we're at. Um, Telemachus is out there. He gets kind of the, the word, the reassurance that, yes, your father is alive. He's out there. He's trying to work his way back home and back at home. The plot now is to assassinate Telemachus when he does get back home. Again, remember that in those books, they're being helped. These mortals are being helped, especially right now, Telemachus, by the gods. And in this case, by Athena, a goddess. Um, and again, that's a huge, 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 huge theme for this story. All right, book five. Here we go. Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus now bundled together. The greatest stories and characters. The Book 5 opens on Mount Olympus, where Athena asks her father, Zeus, to continue to get involved. Zeus decides to send Hermes to help, and also tells Athena to keep helping out Telemachus. Hermes goes down to Calypso's island and tells Calypso to set Odysseus free, also talking about the double standard applying to the gods. This is the first time we meet Odysseus. He's crying, anxious, and homesick. There, there, buddy. It's gonna be all right. Things are gonna go your way. This may be a surprise for some readers because we've heard so much about Odysseus being strong, valiant, and brave. In fact, by showing him in this low state, full of anxiety, and in an intimate, weaker moment, 
We can really see how much this quest has broken him so far, and we can get on the ground floor with understanding him as a complex character with a lot of feelings. Calypso warns Odysseus that the journey ahead will be very difficult and perilous, but assists in helping Odysseus build a ship to finally leave the island. This is where we really see Odysseus' strengths as a builder and craftsman, somebody who can really get stuff done, especially with their own two hands. However, Poseidon's vengeance has not even begun to be taken care of, and he summons a storm to shipwreck Odysseus. Odysseus prays to him to let up. Athena and a sea nymph get involved rescuing him, stranding him on a new island. This time, Scaria, home of the Phaeacians. All right, book five. So we finally get a chance to meet our hero in person, Odysseus. Uh, what happens before that? So on Mount Olympus, which is where Zeus lives. Um, great big mountain, kind of the home of all the gods. Obviously, Olympus, what does that word sound like? Olympics, Olympians, like we think of um, just big, grandiose uh, event. And so Mount Olympus, that's, that's where the gods live, in particular, the father of all the gods, Zeus. So it starts out on Mount Olympus, where Athena, um, requests that as a involved in helping Zeus sends Hermes, his son, one of his sons, to tell Calypso to set Odysseus free. She has been holding Odysseus on her island and not letting him leave to, to get home. So this is where we first meet Odysseus. And he is sad, broken, and homesick. So as we've talked about a hero, um, so far, we've learned about this king, went off to battle, was one of the key figures or instrumental figures in the Trojan War. He's one of the key reasons that the Trojans are defeated. So we think of this big, strong guy, you know, this warrior type type character. And here we see him in a totally different light. Um, we see him. He's got some feelings. He's weeping. He's crying. He wants to go home to his family. Those aren't necessarily traits that we would associate with a hero or like a war hero like Odysseus. So we start to see his character more rounded out. Um, we learn some more things about him uh, being kind of the protagonist of the story and some of the characterization about him. With the urging of the gods and goddesses, Odysseus, or excuse me, Calypso decides to let him free. Um, Odysseus builds. In fact, before we say this, we see another side of Odysseus. Odysseus builds a ship with the help of Calypso. Uh, again, now maybe we're seeing another side of him. We see the fact that he's um, a handyman. He knows how to Old stuff, <laughs> a handyman, strong, and sets off off to sea. Um, but while he's sailing, Poseidon, God, and what do you think he's the god of? He's the god of the sea. Uh, storm. And Odysseus on his ship and washes 
up on the land of the Aishas. Hey, folks, guess what? I'm going to have to look this one up again. I can remember how we spell Phaeacians. That might be it. Yep. Look at how funky that word is to spell. P-H-A-E-A-C-I-A-N-S. Boy, good thing I don't have to learn Greek. <laughs> P-H-A-E-A. S-C-A-N-S. There we go. Land of Phaeacians. And that's where we're left after book five. So, we continue on. Book six and seven. Let's roll. Explore more inspirational recipes at presidentcheese.com. Athena now schemes. How can she get Odysseus to meet Nausicaa, someone who can introduce Odysseus to her father, King Alcinous? She lures Nausicaa and her maidens to the beach where Odysseus is sleeping. But when they see him, completely naked except for a few choice leaves, they all scatter except for Nausicaa, who agrees to help a pleading Odysseus. Because of the codes of hospitality, she agrees to get involved and help Odysseus out. In book seven, Odysseus once again calls on Athena for help. She cloaks him in an obscuring mist, which allows him to do what Nausicaa had advised him to do, meet her mother, Queen Arete. After sneaking into the palace, he throws himself at Arete's feet, begging her for help. Alcinous agrees to help Odysseus, though he does not yet know his identity. Queen Arete is a little more suspicious, and that's when Odysseus tells them about how he met Nausicaa. King Alcinous is very, very impressed with Odysseus' honor and respect that he showed Nausicaa, his daughter. In fact, he wishes that Odysseus would marry Nausicaa, but he agrees to provide him a ship, no wedding required. In these chapters, book six and seven, the theme of devotion comes up quite a bit and hospitality, but also characters cloaking themselves, deception, and keeping their true motives below the surface while asking for help from others. Okay, book six and seven, pretty quick. Uh, not a lot happened in there, but we see um, Odysseus asking Athena for help with that theme of immortals, gods, and goddesses helping out mortals, right? Um, she helps him with deception and being with Introduces to her parents, King Elsinius, and his wife. And I gotta watch my spelling on some of these things. Erte. Again, I'm gonna go to my spell checker. Hey, because what do you do when you're doing research or something like that? You don't know how to spell somebody's name? Well, guess what? Look it up. King Elsin... Elsinous. I'm going to look up his wife. <laughs> See? Look it up. And Queen 
Erite. Perfect. Erite. Sinus. Okay, so again, um, it, they uh, follow themes, hospitality, hospitality, notice that's coming up a lot, and deception is starting to become a theme here. People kind of sneaking by or disguising themselves as this is what Odysseus had to do to get into their palace. Odysseus impresses, aka. Hey, hey. King Elsinius. To the point he wants Odysseus to marry his daughter, but does not force him to. Helps Odysseus build a ship to help him return. So some of the themes, again, that we're seeing here, the hospitality keeps coming up almost in every book so far. Second, gods or goddesses, or what we call immortals, people that can't die, helping out mortals. And we started to see deception now being a theme. Deception being people kind of hiding or disguising themselves in order to get something done or to get in a certain situation. We've seen Athena do that a few times now. Um, we've seen other characters do it. We've, we see Odysseus do it here uh, in order to, to kind of weasel his way into the king and queen's home. All right, book eight, the last one that we're going to talk about here. I've been obsessed with belts for a long time. I wear a belt every day. And there was like three things that always drove me crazy about belts. You have all these holes. Book eight opens with King Alcinous, aided secretly by Athena, calling on his people to build a ship and gather a crew to help Odysseus leave. He promises the crew a feast and a great gathering is put together in Odysseus's honor. Here we meet Demodocus, the singing bard, who sings of a story of the great Odysseus and Agamemnon's verbal battle in the Trojan War. Now remember, nobody yet realizes Odysseus's identity. So when he is sitting there and starts <laughs> weeping, Alcinous doesn't know what's going on. He decides that maybe he better help his guest out a little by distracting everyone from the crying with an athletic competition. Odysseus turns down the athletic competition, citing his fatigue from all his travel. But when some of the gathered crew begin to make fun of him, the hubris proves too much. He's just got to be the best. He easily crushes everyone in the competition. And King Alcinous demands gifts be given to him. Here comes Demodocus once more to sing a song about Troy's fall at the hands of the brave Odysseus. Odysseus in disguise again weeps. Finally, it proves too much. He reveals his identity to the king and the people gathered. There's a lot we get out of this. First of all, the role of deception once again in creating a distance between reality and illusion. Something else worth noting is Demodocus, the role of the bard in ancient Greek society, the oral tradition of singing and telling stories to pass on mythology, the way information spread. And there are some people who even think Demodocus is supposed to be Homer. Book eight. The last thing that we don't really read as a class as we're reading through the Odyssey, but gets us going then into where we jump in with Odysseus more specifically on his Odyssey back home. What do we learn here? Well, he's at the palace. So uh, there is a big send off party for Odysseus put on by K.A. Where Odysseus, put still in disguise, 
No one knows he's Odysseus. Starts weeping. King Alcinius. <laughs> I can just kind of see this scene like this king is sitting next to this this kind of big, strong, powerful looking guy. And the guy like starts weeping when this this story is being told, like really awkward, like being like, um, what do I do here? Do I like just put a real awkward spot? And I always kind of chuckle when I when I read this. Um, so King Alcinius uh, in an effort to distract from Odysseus' weeping, suggests an athletic competition. Odysseus does not want to participate. Uh, almost in an effort, like he knows he's he's a great athlete and will probably win all these athletic competitions, but that might maybe give away his disguise a little bit. So he thinks of some excuses not to do it. Um, and some of the other men at the party start to kind of mock him and laugh at him like, come on, you sissy or whatever. You know how that could go. And this shows one of then Odysseus's character traits. We can look at it as a positive or a negative, and we will see it as both throughout the story. Like he's got so much pride, um, almost to the extent where it's, it's negative sometimes, almost some arrogance. Like he knows this is a time for him to shine and show off. And he, he's trying not to, not to do it, but it gets the best of him. And finally he's like, forget it. I got to go ahead. And he goes out in the yard and just dominates these guys in all these athletic competitions. So Odysseus reluctantly participates. I say reluctantly and like he didn't want to, cause he doesn't want to throw off his disguise, but in a, like he, he wants to go out there cause he wants to show like, Hey, I'm the man, I'm better than all you guys. And he just can't hold himself back from the opportunity to do that. Um, so Odysseus reluctantly participates, but uh, his pride, I'm going to even say his arrogance, it's the best of him, and he dominates. And they go back into that big party, that dinner, and he sits there and starts weeping again when uh, the guy starts playing music and talking about uh, the battle of Troy and all the stuff that happened with it uh, because it brings back those memories for him. So, um, yes, starts in and finally, um, let's know who he is. So he reveals the truth about himself. Uh, so here again, it talked about some more of these themes that it shows. It shows the deception again. Um, we see the hospitality there. They're throwing this this big, huge kind of farewell party for him. Uh, they've even agreed to build him a big ship, give him a crew to, to sail with so that he's not out trying to get across all these big seas by himself. Um, so again, those those overhauling themes that we're going to keep seeing again and again pop up again in book eight, where they finally see that this is Odysseus and he's traveling back home. Great start. Books one through eight, done, complete. You're not going to get through eight books this fast ever again as we're studying the Odyssey because we'll start to kind of look into them and read into them more individually as we go. Thank you for listening. Go Broncos. Go Peyton Manning, my hero, even though he doesn't play anymore. Go Odysseus. I hope he makes it home. Yes. The last couple times I've read it, I, I'm not even going to spoil it for you. I don't think the outcome has changed. Um, but enjoy. It's a cool book. Book. Epic poem. I'm off. See ya.